So first I will explain you what meta-analysis are and why they are important. What I will do is I will first talk about what I would call the explosion of science. Then I will explain to you what traditional and systematic reviews are and what, uh, what the difference between the two uh, types of reviews are. I will, I will say something about the advantages of systematic reviews, but I, I will also talk about the problems of systematic reviews, which we should always keep in mind when we do systematic reviews and meta-analysis. But first, what I, would, what, what I call the explosion of science. What, you, what I mean with that is that, the, that there is an exponential increase in research over the past decades. And that includes the number of randomized controlled trials in healthcare in general. For example, in 1965, there were only 39 randomized trials if you look in the largest bibliographical database available, PubMed. While in 2013, that number had increased to more than 16,000 randomized trials. And that would not be such a big problem if all those trials would point in the same direction. But what happens if you do a trial on a specific outcome, the results of that trial may differ from another trial with the same participants, on the same disorder, with the same treatment. And that's, uh, that's a problem, because then we never know what the right effects are, what, what exactly are the effects of that intervention if one trial points at this and another trial points at another outcome. So what you see here is the accumulation of randomized trials identified over uh, the years uh, in PubMed. And what you see is that since 1965, uh, there is that exponential increase in randomized trials with now more than 350,000 randomized trials in PubMed. So if we wanna, wanna keep track of what happens in this field, in a specific subfield, then we need to have methods to integrate that result, those results into one overall estimate of, uh, that, of what is happening of those trials in that field. So if we think of where did that, uh, those, that, that, that uh, movement of meta-analysis, where did it start? Well, most people would say that modern meta-analysis started with the presentation of Gene Glass at the American Educational Research Association in 1976. There he explained the basics of the method, uh, how to calculate effect sizes and how you can pool them. If we talk about meta-analysis, it's also very important to realize that the Cochrane collaboration is a worldwide important source and uh, movement in this field. What the Cochrane collaboration tries and wants to do is prepare and maintain and disseminate systematic reviews in healthcare. It's not specific to one field, what they want to do is integrate the results of randomized trials in high quality meta-analysis that can be used by patients, policymakers, and clinicians. What we see since the 1970s is that there is also an increasing number of published meta-analysis and more and more treatment guidelines base their uh, advices on healthcare professionals on meta-analysis. And for example, what you here see is the number of new meta-analysis published in PubMed over the years. And you see that same increase in, uh, uh, in meta-analysis published. So what is, what is a meta-analysis and what, how does it compare to traditional uh, reviews? Well, if you look at traditional reviews, they're typically written by an expert in a field. How that expert selects studies to be included in that review is usually not clear. And what, what, those, what an expert like that often does is just summarize the results uh, according to his or her opinion. But it's usually not very systematic. 
And if somebody else would look at that same field, maybe the selection of studies or the presentation of the results or the weaknesses could be very different. So the, the problem with traditional reviews or narrative reviews is that the value of the conclusions cannot be verified. And this, these reviews are mainly based on authority of the expert who writes it. And it's not very transparent how that expert gets to his or her conclusions. A systematic review is different. In a systematic review, you have a clear ob objective of that study with predefined eligibility criteria for studies to be included. It uses an explicit and reproducible methodology and it uses a systematic search of studies um, and it tries to, in a systematic way, include all the available studies in that specific field. Uh, regardless of whether they support an opinion or do not support an opinion. These studies are also all rated on their validity. Are the results valid of these trials? And the, there is more emphasis on studies with high validity. The th synthesis of the results of those studies is also very systematic and can be reproduced by uh, independent researchers. A meta-analysis is a specific type of systematic review in which the results of individual studies are statistically integrated into one outcome. There are different types of meta-analysis and I won't go too deep into that. What, we will, what I will teach in this course is what I would call the traditional meta-analysis. A comparison of two groups uh, studies examining, comparing two groups, a treatment group and a control group. And then the, uh, you pool effect sizes of those two uh, groups uh, across studies. But there are other types of meta-analysis. For example, a network meta-analysis that is not limited to that one comparison. What you can do in a meta-analysis is you, you have, for example, two treatments, treatment A and treatment B, and some studies compare treatment A to a control group, others compare treatment B to a control group, while a third type of study compares treatment A and B to each other. And you can all put that together in one large meta-analysis. In those network meta-analysis, you make use of the power of multiple types of studies within that meta-analysis. Another type of meta-analysis which is very interesting and which is used more and more is what, what, what is called the individual patient data meta-analysis. What you do in these, these meta-analysis is that you collect the primary data of randomized trials from a systematic review and make one big data set with all the patient level data uh, from those trials. And the big advantage of those meta-analyses is that they have sufficient statistical power to examine moderators of outcome. Are there specific patients group, patient groups who benefit more from a treatment than other patient groups? So there are several advantages of systematic reviews. You have much more power because you combine the results of individual studies. You can give a more precise and accurate estimate of effect sizes um, uh, because you're not limited to one or a few studies. Uh, you can, if you find inconsistent findings within that uh, field, you can examine them, you can analyze them, and you can examine differences between subgroups of studies. And a final advantage is that you can test publication bias. And I will come back later in this course uh, on methods how you can examine it. But publication, publication bias refers to the problem that some studies, usually negative studies, are not published. And then if you only look in a meta-analysis to the published studies, that overestimates the, the true effect sizes but because you haven't uh, included 
the negative studies that have been done that have not been published. So how can you use meta-analysis? Well, doctors and therapists can use it to, to make clinical decisions on an individual patient, or it can be used to, in clinical guidelines, which give indications to therapists how to treat specific patients. It's also important for policymakers because they can decide uh, on the basis of meta-analysis which treatment should be funded and which should not be funded. Of course, it's also important for patients because they can think about the effects of a treatment and whether they are willing to accept such a treatment or not. For researchers, meta-analysis have additional values because it often results in new research questions. You can prevent all kinds of methodological limitations and you can use, for example, meta-analysis to calculate samples, the, 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 uh, the sample sizes you need for a new trial. But there are, of course, also many problems of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, it's not always true that a series of small studies that are integrated in one meta-analysis are as good as one large study having the same sample size. If that large study is designed well and has sufficient statistical power to examine it, then I think I would prefer that over a sample of small studies with varying quality, with differ differences between patient samples or between uh, uh, all kinds of study characteristics. So it's not always true that a meta-analysis is better than individual trials. One other problem is that a meta-analysis can never be better than the studies included in it. So if you have bad studies included in your meta-analysis, no sophisticated analysis or meta-analysis or whatever can solve that problem. And some people call it the garbage in, garbage out principle. If you do not have good studies, your meta-analysis may be done properly, but the results are still not good enough. Other people say that when you do meta-analysis, especially in our field of psychological interventions, that you combine apples and oranges. Because most studies include all kinds of different patients groups, there are differences between treatments, the number of sessions differs, uh, some studies deliver the treatment in group therapy, other in individual therapy, uh, the control groups may be somewhat different, etc., etc. And some people say, well, that's all very nice, but if you combine that in a meta-analysis, then you combine apples and oranges because these things are so different, they really cannot be compared with each other. Another problem I would mention here is what I would call agenda-driven bias and researcher allegiance. What, ha what often happens in the field of meta-analysis is that you have researchers or clinicians who are very much in favor of a certain treatment and they do a meta-analysis just to show that their, that their treatment is working very well. And they are very eager to show positive effects of their treatment because that they can use that to stimulate or encourage other people to use their treatment. And that's, uh, I think that's an important source of bias in our field, in the field of meta-analysis. And we should be all, always careful not to do that and uh, make sure that we are not uh, uh, making these kinds of mistakes. Finally, I will show a nice paper from the British Journal of Psychiatry tr in which they have, uh, I, which shows that we do not have to do randomized trials and meta-analysis on anything. This is, uh, uh, as a joke, in the British, journal, British Medical Journal, they conducted a systematic review on uh, the use of parachutes when people jump out of airplanes. And they found no randomized trial uh, to examine whether that worked. And uh, so the conclusion of the systematic review is that if you jump out of an airplane, there is no evidence that a parachute will uh, help you 
uh, reduce the damage when you get to the ground, which is, of course, nonsense. And um, sh this shows that we should, we should not think that everything we do in healthcare or outside healthcare has to be supported by randomized trials and meta-analysis. So the key points of this part. Because of the exponential growth of research, we need methods to integrate the results of multiple studies. Traditional reviews are not systematic and transparent enough, and they cannot solve that need for integration of uh, research. Systematic reviews have a reproducible methodology, and meta-analysis meta can certainly uh, in which the results of individual trials are integrated statistically can certainly help to integrate the results of mul multiple studies. And these systematic reviews and meta-analysis have many advantages for professionals, patients, policymakers, and researchers. But there's also risks we should be aware of. Risk of bias, the problem of garbage in, garbage out, and the problem of combining apples and oranges.